Introducing the Little Green Seeding Machine. This tool can help you seed your microgreens up to 300 trays per hour. With all this extra free time you'll have, you can spend it growing the business with sales and production, or you can spend more time with family and friends and less time on the farm. The Little Green Seed Machine works with all of the most common microgreens varieties, including pea, sunflower, radish, brassicas, mustards, amaranth, basil, and so many more. This tool seeds much more evenly than hand seeding, reducing disease risk while also increasing the uniformity of your crops, and do it twice as fast. Pre-order your Little Green Seed Machine today and join the microgreens revolution. Welcome to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. podcast everyone on today's episode we'll be diving deep into the environmental control options for your farm whether you're growing microgreens in your home or on a commercial scale environmental controls are extremely important in creating a high quality and consistent final product for your farm i've seen farms that have really great growing recipes amazing marketing tactics a really great farm team but because their humidity and temperature was too high they were getting massive crop failures as I mentioned in other episodes, using the weakest link model will help you determine what you need to focus your energy on in your farm and business. A great analogy for this is a human body. If you're in great shape and exercise and do things like cardio and weightlifting, your heart's going to be in great condition. But if you drink copious amounts of alcohol, your liver will probably have damage and thus will slow down the whole system, uh, causing potential downstream health effects, not only for your liver, which is where you know alcohol gets uh, processed, but also for the rest of your body. So your farm and your business is also a system. And if any of the parts of the system are behind or weak, it will slow down your ability to grow the business sustainably. There are four main environmental controls in a farm, and they are humidity, temperature, CO2, and airflow. We'll touch on each one of these and the recommendations for both in-home farms and commercial scale farms. And then lastly, we'll talk about germination rooms and if they make sense to implement at different scales of production. So let's start with in-home farms. So this is where most people will be at that are listening to this podcast, which is great because it saves on costs. It's, the, in my opinion, the best way to start a, a microgreens farm is in your house. So a lot of people are going to be in this position where they have a farm, but they're not sure you know, what kind of environmental controls they need. So we'll go through each one, one by one. So we'll start with humidity. So humidity is really important because uh, plants will be affected by the uh, humidity in the air. So, um, you know, one of them is pathogens. So pathogens are much more uh, common in a really humid environment. That's why if you go into like a jungle, uh, you'll see that like your clothes and pretty much everything will just be full of mold uh, because fungus and bacteria are much better able to live in the air when there's more humidity, just like, you know, for us, if we have 0% humidity uh, in the air, our skin starts getting dry, it starts cracking, we need humidity as humans, and so does bacteria and fungus, and so does plants. Um, but the challenge is when it's too humid, then plants will, uh, you know, get disease, have a lot harder time transpiring. So uh, the, pretty much plants absorb water through uh, the soil, through osmosis, through the roots, and then uh, they will transpire the excess moisture into the air through their leaves. And if it's 100% humidity, it's very hard for them to do that, which is why when you see microgreen trays that are extremely wet, uh, the plants can't often grow as well because they're struggling to transpire uh, the excess humidity out. So having a balance of humidity is really important. You don't want it too low and you don't want it too high. So generally I recommend 40 to 60%. But uh, sometimes if you live in a really arid climate, it may be less than that. So really, like if you're anywhere above 30 percent, up to 60 percent, you'll be good. Above 60 percent, you start running into issues. And above 70 uh, percent is where it's like a red flag should be raised that like you need to lower the humidity because not only are you potentially uh, having lo lower growth or, or more uh, disease issues, but things like drywall start will start absorbing the moisture in your house. So it's really, really important to keep it under 70% um, to prevent those type of things from happening. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, 
what kind of equipment, what do you kind of need to control humidity? So this, this is a big one. Um, a lot of farms, when you're just starting out at home, you may not need anything. You know, if you live in most of, you know, the United States, Canada, most places you're going to have some sort of heating and cooling. Uh, and the cooling component of that uh, is air conditioning. And air conditioning actually removes some humidity from the air in the process of actually cooling down the air. So generally speaking, if you're just starting out, you're growing like, you know, five to 30 trays sort of thing, you probably don't need anything. But as you expand the business, you may have a, a larger requirement for managing the humidity. So it's good to know, even if you're at that stage, what you can do in the future when the time comes. So there's pretty much, uh, you know, two main ways to control humidity. Uh, the third one being air conditioning, but that's not, you know, that's an indirect component. Because, for example, in the winter, you're not going to turn your air conditioning on to dehumidify the air. It just doesn't make sense. So because plants give off humidity as they grow, generally speaking, the main control is going to be reducing humidity, not increasing it. Um, unless you're in like a very, very arid uh, climate where your humidity is like 10% sort of thing, you might need to humidify. Uh, but generally speaking, most people are going to need to dehumidify. And there's two ways to dehumidify. Uh, again, besides air conditioning, which is number one, would be using a uh, dehumidifier, which is the simplest way and most common way people do it. And the other one, uh, other way is with uh, exhaust. So an exhaust fan or an exhaust system that will suck the humid air out of your space uh, and allow less humid air from outside to come in. So the exhausting method is uh, great if you're in a uh, more cold or drier climate. So if you're in a desert climate, or if you're in a fairly northern climate that's relatively dry most of the year, uh, then you know using a exhaust system is going to be much less expensive to set up, but then also to operate. So pretty much all you're doing is running a fan, uh, a specific type of fan. It's called inline fan that will suck the air from your your growing space into the outside environment. Most likely outside, you generally don't want that humid air going to the rest of your house, um, so you want to just exhaust that outside. So that can be done through a window. That can be done any other sort of exhaust system you have in your house. So if you have an HVAC system that already has an exhaust, then you can hook it up to that. But generally a window is the simplest way to do it. So setup is a little more complicated because you have to like, you know, get it set up to exhaust the air out. But from an operational perspective, it's much less expensive because you're running a fan instead of the other option, which is dehumidification. And dehumidification has, uh, two main you know downsides uh and there are a lot of upside but the two main downsides are is they're pretty expensive to operate you know relative to exhaust fans because they take a lot of energy um because they pretty much are a modified air conditioner so a dehumidifier uh gets moisture out of the air in the same way an air conditioner does but an air conditioner produces cold air as the main component component and then dehumidifies as a secondary feature whereas a dehumidifier will dehumidify the air move moisture from the air but also uh, a, a kind of negative is that it heats up the space. So when you have grow lights uh, and dehumidifiers running at the same time, your grow space can get quite warm. And then you sometimes have to run air conditioning uh, in, you know, when it's not actually that hot outside. So uh, if you can, exhaust fans are a better way to go. But if you live in like Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, um, a, a lot of really humid places most of the year, it just won't work. It's it because you have to have dry air outside. So if your air outside most of the year is not dry, then this method won't really work. Whereas in Canada, where I am, we have like two months of what would be considered a summer in most places. Um, so you can really get away with uh, using an exhaust fan instead of dehumidifiers. So in terms of uh, you know, what kind of exhaust fans and what type of dehumidifiers do you need? You have to size it depending on the size of your room. So it's hard for me to give specifics here. Um, but, you know, for example, I had like a 500 square foot basement when I started growing and I had a um, eight inch exhaust fan, uh, inline exhaust fan. So that that's like, you know, and then uh, for a larger scale facility, like a 2000 square foot commercial facility, we had uh, two 12 inch fan so two of them so equivalent of like 24 inches so you can see it starts getting larger and larger of an exhaust fan you need to get the humid air out of your space as you get bigger so uh, and then and then on dehumidification front maybe in a 500 square foot room you might need two or three 70 or 75 pint dehumidifiers 
And then once you start scaling up to a larger scale facility, you might need like 10 of those. So then getting commercial grade equipment like the Quest units may make more sense. Um, but uh, th so th those are really the options you have to control humidity. And again, you don't need to get it from, you know, if, if your humidity is 70% is in your house, you don't need to get it to 40 necessarily. Like you can get it to 50 and be totally fine. So 50 is like a great target. I would say uh, it's a, the best balance point um, for growing microgreens is, is 50%. Um, but, you know, having it be lower is totally okay. And having it being a bit higher is okay as well. So that's humidity. Um, next is temperature. So temperature is really, really important because uh, it, it determines the speed of the growth of your plants. So if you uh, grow, you know, let's say you're, you're growing in your basement and it's 60 Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius, um, a lot of plants will grow significantly slower at that temperature than 70 and especially 80 Fahrenheit. So the colder your space is, uh, the slower the growth is going to be, meaning it takes more days for your plants to actually mature and be ready to harvest. So a simple thing you can do if your temperature is too low is to add a heater to your space. And that's a super simple thing. You can go to Home Depot, Walmart, get a room space heater, plug it in, set the temperature you want, boom, simple solution. Now, if your grow space is too warm, which generally speaking will probably be the scenario you get in once you start running a lot of lights and a lot of dehumidifiers, then controlling the temperature downwards with air conditioning will be the method uh, uh, or approach you want to take. So there's a few options there. Obviously, you can run your, you know, if you have a central air conditioning unit, um, then run it to your normal temperature. And then you may have to have like an additional ductless unit. So either like a wall ductless unit or the ones that just exhaust out the window. Um, and that would allow you to manage the, the, the cooling separately than the rest of your home. Now, if you don't have, uh, you know, if you don't have air conditioning in your home, that's okay. This is really only going to be an issue when you start scaling up. And once you start scaling up and you have like, you know, 200 trays, 300 trays in your basement or, or a bedroom, you can afford to buy, uh, you know, these air conditioning units. It's not going to break the bank to do so. Um, and it will probably actually save you money in the long run. Cause like I mentioned at the beginning, if you have a farm and you have humidity and temperature issues and it's causing your crops either not germinate or uh, to get a lot of dampening off or disease, you know, what's that cost of that? And it's going to, I can tell you right now, it's going to be a lot higher than buying, uh, you know, a portable air conditioning unit or buying dehumidifiers. So uh, when the time is right and you need it, these are easy things to buy that you can buy locally, um, you know, at Home Depots, Walmarts, et cetera. So um, it's just good to have a plan in place so that you're not panicking and being like, oh my God, there's like mold growing on my wall or there's uh, my crops are failing because the temperature is too high. Uh, now, in terms of optimal temperature, I would say like 78 to 80 is an optimal temperature that is quite warm for most people in terms of like, you know, relative to what they keep their house at. Most people keep their house at around 70 Fahrenheit uh, or like 21 Celsius. So, um, you know, it's OK if your if your room gets a bit warmer. That's actually a good thing because it'll speed up the growth of your crops. But if it starts getting above 80 Fahrenheit, you're talking about like 85 plus um, at, at ambient temperature you really need to uh, manage the temperature because certain crops like cilantro won't germinate. Dampening off will absolutely thrive in that environment. So you will find that you will get significantly more disease pressure by um, uh, not managing the temperature. So that's really important. So those are some you know, great you know, starting points on, on temperature and, uh, and we'll get you in the range of you know, roughly 70 to 80 will work, but to optimize growth speed, 80 will be the best temperature to operate at. Now with CO2 uh, is the next thing we're going to talk about. This is not something that's, you know, really critical, um, you know, with microgreens. If you're growing other types of crops in vertical farming situations, definitely you need to manage CO2. Also, if you're dehumidif dehumidifying the space, um, you're mo it's more important to uh, monitor CO2 than if you're exhausting air out because you're going to be getting fresh air in. Um, all the time when you're exhausting air out because, you know, the, the air has to bounce. So there, even if you don't have uh, an inlet fan, you still will have air coming in through cracks and doors and stuff like that. So you don't necessarily need an inline uh, fan, but CO2 and fresh air will come in through the cracks and crevices of your house or, you know, on a commercial scale facility. Um, we never added CO2. So that's something that is an option. 
is uh, it's not common with microgreens, but very, very common with growing lettuce, uh, tomatoes, other sort of crops is adding CO2 to speed up the growth of plants. Again, it comes down to like the weakest link. So if you have everything perfected, everything is perfect in your growing setup, but CO2 is either ambient, which is, you know, 400 to 450 uh, PPM, or it starts getting lower in the 300s, uh, it can be a limiting factor for the growth of your crops. And again, this is more applicable to things like lettuce um, than, you know, or tomatoes than to microgreens, but it still will become the limiting factor in your growth if it gets to too low of a level. And if you don't have fresh air coming in, then CO2 will naturally deplete over time. Now, keep in mind in a house, you, you, there's always higher CO2 levels in a house or in a building than outside because there's people usually inside and they're breathing in this, the uh, oxygen and exchanging it for CO2. So CO2 levels are generally higher indoors. So generally speaking, you don't need to supplement with CO2. If you are uh, you know, dehumidifying and you're growing a lot of crops in a small space, it would be good to have a CO2 monitor. So rather than like having to add CO2, just keep an eye on it. Now, these aren't the cheapest items. So again, when you're starting out, these aren't recommended, but it is good to know what your levels are at so that if they do get in the 300s, you know, okay, either I need to bring some fresh air in or add in CO2 um, into my system. Uh, but again, generally speaking, this is not something that migraines farms have to really worry about as long as you're not growing super, super dense in a small space and, um, you're, you know, you have doors and windows that are being opened, you know, at points in time, like to get fresh air in there. And then the last main, you know, environmental control in a farm will be airflow. So this one is also very important. So airflow is something that is often, I see done the wrong way. In microgreens farms, especially at home farms, where, uh, as an example, you have airflow with those little tiny computer fans blowing directly on the crop for the whole life cycle of the crop. I think that often will cause more issues with with moisture. So when you water, you know, the, the crops, then uh, if you have fans blowing only in one direction consistently, those spots will dry out faster than the areas that aren't getting consistent airflow. So I think it's overkill to use those computer fans and it will create inconsistency in your crop. So I definitely don't recommend that. But having said that, airflow is really important. So you don't want stale air. So, you know, normally in a house, you're going to have, maybe you have a central heating and cooling system and that will provide like a tiny bit of movement of air. If you're on a, um, uh, like a baseboard heater, for example, and you don't have fans constantly running your house, you'll feel a temperature difference near the ceiling and at the floor, it can be quite substantial. So to keep that temperature the same at the ground level and the ceiling, having some sort of fan, whether that's a ceiling fan or having wall mounted or floor fans will circulate that air. Um, and generally for airflow, you either want one of two patterns. So you either want a pattern that's moving the air circular in the room horizontally or circular in the room vertically. And the reason you want that is so that all the air is being moved uh, uh, in a pattern that allows no st no stale spots of air because then it could be more humid, it could be warmer or colder, it could be less humid, um, and uh, you just want that. And the CO two as well, you want CO two to be replenished where the plants are because that's where it's absorbed. So having a little bit of airflow um, will allow those really important uh, uh, consistent consistencies in the air to occur. Um, this will also have a major impact on reducing the possibility of mold spores forming. So as you know, naturally speaking, there's going to be mold, uh, small amounts in the air, and especially in the soil that you're growing in, whether you're in with permix, outdoor soil, coconut coir, there will be mold uh, and spores that form. Uh, what you really don't want is those spores to land on your soil and then uh, start reproducing. So having the airflow prevents the mold or, or prevents the spores from sticking to the soil and then just keep blowing in the air. Uh, and that will prevent actual mold from forming on your crops. So again, you don't need like hurricane force winds. You want like a slight, slight breeze, like you're outside on a windy day and the leaves are just slightly moving on a tree. Um, so it's, I, I don't know how to quantify that in numbers. It's probably like a mile or two, maybe three or four uh, per hour equivalent um, consistent within the room. So 
Um, that's what you just want for general airflow. Now, before harvest is a different situation. So because microgreens are grown so densely, um, and generally I recommend to grow them uh, not as densely as some people do, and you can find out more information about that in our uh, free growing guide on our website, which talks about all the different factors you need to consider to start growing microgreens, um, including the seed densities, which are really important in allowing enough airflow on your crops. So for example, if you're growing broccoli and you're growing 30 grams uh, of seed in a tray, it's gonna be really hard to get airflow in the center of that tray because it's just so dense of a canopy. Whereas if you grow at low, lower seeding rates, um, the air can actually get through and your crops will be dry before you harvest them. Now, to, keep, to ensure the crops are dry before harvest, what I do recommend is having either a wall-mounted fan or a floor stand fan that's oscillating uh, and, and on full blast speed, hitting the crops directly the day before harvest. And this will allow any moisture that is on the canopy of the crop to uh, be expelled into the air so that when you harvest the crop, it's perfectly dry. There's no moisture on the leaves because that will have a major impact on the shelf life of the crop. So those are the tips and tricks for at-home farms. Now uh, we're gonna get into commercial scale farms, which is often very similar. So we won't touch on the same things. It'll just be how to apply these same principles to commercial scale farms. So again, with humidity, um, you wanna make sure that you're controlling it between 40 and 60%, but anywhere really between like 30 and 60 is totally okay. As you get to commercial scale, you're probably going to have a lot of humidity because you're probably going to have a lot of plants growing. So if you're growing 500, 1,000 trays of microgreens, there's going to be a lot of humidity. You think about it, that's like millions of plants uh, that are growing at once, expelling humidity uh, as they absorb moisture through the air. So there is commercial grade equipment that can be used to manage this. So the first one I recommend if you are in a commercial facility is sizing your air conditioning higher than you actually need. So in the summer months is generally when it's going to be the most humid wherever you are. Um, unless, again, you're in the desert climate, which is a whole other uh, you know, situation um, where you have to manage humidity on the upward side rather than decreasing it. But um, air conditioning, uh, oversizing it allows a good baseline of moisture to be removed from the air consistently throughout the growth cycle. So um, if you undersize your air conditioner, uh, you're not only having the issue of managing getting the temperature down, but you're going to have more dehumidifiers most likely if you're dehumidifying in your space, and that's going to put extra strain on the air conditioner. So you want to oversize the air conditioner for the space you need, and a HVAC technician can help you uh, calculate this. You pretty much would calculate how many BTUs your lights are giving off, what you would normally put as an air conditioner in that side of space, and then add like, you know, a 10 or 20% buffer to increase the tonnage of air conditioning to make sure that you never hit max capacity and are running that thing all the time because that will also uh, reduce the amount of years that the air conditioner will last. So there's a lot of factors at play there, uh, but air conditioner is number one for sure in that you want to oversize it and make sure you have sufficient air cooling capacity for your commercial farm. Number two is if you are dehumidifying, uh, it probably makes sense to start buying commercial grade equipment. So uh, those little 75 pint dehumidifiers, they are cheaper to buy, um, but you're gonna have to have like, you know, 20, 30 of them uh, in your farm. And it just starts getting a little bit ridiculous from a space perspective, because you don't want, you know, your floor space to be used up for dehumidifiers. It's much better used to grow the crops and the racking and that sort of thing. Uh, so what you can do with some of these commercial grade is hook them up on the ceiling height. Uh, and having them on the ceiling height will allow actually more of the humid air to be uh, removed from the space. So when you have a, a dehumidifier at ground level, there's actually less moisture because temperatures are generally a bit lower. So as you get closer to your ceiling, there's going to be higher temperatures. And with higher temperatures means more moisture holding capacity in the air, which is why in the winter months, uh, for people that don't know, even if it says that it's like 80% relative humidity on the weather forecast, it's still very, very dry if it's like 32 Fahrenheit or below or even 50 Fahrenheit because the colder the air is, the more dense it is and the less moisture can hold. Whereas air that's really uh, warm uh, is less dense and can have more moisture in that air. So it's a really important uh, uh, concept to understand that relative humidity is not the same as total humidity. Now, relative humidity at a given temperature. So, you know, if you're growing at 
80 Fahrenheit and it's 60% uh, humidity, there's a lot more moisture in the air than if you're growing at 20 uh, degrees Celsius or, or 70 Fahrenheit with 60% humidity. But that range of 40, 60% is okay no matter what temperature you're growing at in the 70 to 80 range because the dew point gets higher as the temperature gets higher. So there's less chance of condensation. But point being is that uh, you want to have your dehumidifiers, if possible, near the ceiling and uh, because more moisture will be taken out of the environment. And dehumidifiers work best in more humid air because they get more air out. So if you're trying to dehumidify from like 40% to 35%, it's going to be much less efficient electricity wise than if you're trying to get it from 70 to 65 because it has to work less to reduce that humidity at a higher humidity level. So that, that's what I recommend for humidity for commercial farms for temperature um, you want to have uh, you know as you get to larger scale facilities you want to have consistent temperature throughout the space so the higher the ceiling you have the more uh, chance that you're going to have a difference between the temperature at ground level and the temperature at you know 15 16 20 feet up depending on how high you're growing your crops so having ceiling fans that circulate the air this way vertically will allow a more consistent air temperature if it's, you know, if you don't have much insulation on your building and it's, you know, below freezing minus, you know, below 32 Fahrenheit or zero Celsius um, and you don't have much insulation, you're still going to have a temperature difference. Or if it's really hot, if you're in the desert and it's like 100 Fahrenheit and you're trying to keep it at, let's say, 80, um, you know, you're going to have a big temperature difference inside, outside. Unless your space is really well uh, insulated, there will be a slight difference from the lower to higher uh, tiers of your growing system. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because you can utilize that difference to grow different crops. So things like basil really love the heat. They love like their ideal temperature is 86 Fahrenheit, whereas something like, you know, cilantro won't fare well at 86 Fahrenheit, but it will will do totally fine at 80. So if you have, um, you know, a, a lower and higher temperature, you can pick and choose the crops that you grow at those levels to accommodate for that difference. And this applies also for at home farms if you have a big temperature difference from ceiling to floor. In terms of uh, what equipment you can use for temperature is a standard like, you know, HVAC system that has uh, either gas is generally the most common way to heat in these types of spaces, natural gas or electric or oil, but generally oil is not common in these setups. So uh, you generally don't need to oversize your heating because you're gonna be already producing a lot of heat. So whatever is normally recommended for you know, let's say you're doing a 2000 square foot facility and they recommend a, th a hundred thousand BTUs of heat, go with that. You don't need to upsize it like you do with the air conditioner because um, there is no benefit. You're already producing heat with the lights and dehumidifiers and potentially, you know, if you have a cooler in your space, that sort of thing. So no need for that. What I would recommend is uh, if you have a larger facility and you are renovating it to put ducting in so that you have consistent, um, uh, temperature throughout your space, especially if you're in an extreme climate, whether that's cool, uh, a really cold climate or a really warm climate, it's best to have ducting to direct the air more evenly. And then the ceiling fans can be used to uh, ensure the, the air temperature from bottom to ceiling is uh, even. Next is CO2. Once you get to a commercial scale farm, unless you are exhausting air out, I highly recommend having a CO2 monitor just to ensure that your levels are sufficient for growing the crops because that can uh, easily become the weakest link. Uh, it's not often that it does become the weakest link in, in a farm uh, that's growing microgreens, but it is definitely possible. And it, once you're at a commercial scale facility to spend 100 or $200 on a CO2 monitor is well worth it to make sure it doesn't get below, uh, you know, significantly below ambient levels. So super simple. If you do need to add CO2, um, there are you know, methods you can do it. Generally, it's, it'd be cheaper and more effective to just get it back to ambient by bringing in fresh air outside. That's probably the best way to do it if you are going to do it. Um, you know, some farms will increase uh, CO2 to like a thousand ppm, so more than double the ambient, and that will grow fast, crop, uh, grow crops faster um, for sure. But then you cannot, you, you know, you want to keep that CO2 in, and you can't really exhaust air. So. Um, it's something to keep in mind depending on the system you're setting up. Again, generally, micro farms don't do this, but it would increase the yields of your crops. But <laughs> there is much better ways to increase yields that a lot of farms aren't utilizing by using uh, proper lighting, uh, proper watering methods. 
the best soil recipes, which, you know, I offer for free on our website um, and uh, airflow management and things like that. So, uh, and, and using high quality seeds, all that kind of stuff will influence how well the crops grow and CO2 will influence that as well. But it is one that's a lot more expensive to implement and utilize than all those other ones, which are, uh, have very high returns on investment. Lastly is airflow. So as I mentioned, um, for uh, commercial facilities, I definitely recommend having ceiling fans uh, to make the air, air temperature the same from ceiling to floor. And then the wall mount fans or, you know, depending on how high you're growing, uh, if it's just on, you know, the, with the regular racks, you can just have uh, fans on the floor to dry out the crop before harvest. So nothing really different there uh, than in a home, the same concepts apply. When you move to a commercial farm, you will notice there will be different air patterns because there's different objects and things in the way. So if you have like a rack and then you have the lights, uh, you know, or you, let's say you have the rack and then you have a fan on the ceiling. And if the fan is directly above the rack, you know, some of those top levels will probably get too dry. So you want to put your uh, uh, your fans in, a, in accordance so they're not getting like a ton of airflow on the crops. You're just really using this as a way to create that light breeze. Uh, and then to move the air uh, to create a consistent throughout the space. And lastly, we're gonna talk about uh, germination space. Is it worth it? Uh, should you implement it in an at-home farm or a commercial farm? So I guess the first question you probably ask is like, why do I need a germination space or germination room? Um, and the simple answer is you definitely don't. Uh, it's not a requirement at all. Uh, your crops will germinate totally fine as long as there's not a ton of airflow hitting them just by stacking them and putting them on top of your current growing racks. So that's the first thing is it's absolutely not necessary, but there are some benefits to having a germination room. Uh, you can control the humidity, temperature, and airflow much better than you can in your regular space. And you will have uh, different requirements for the crops at that stage. So generally speaking, when crops are germinating, it's better to have higher humidity then uh, you know you don't like 40% humidity is probably going to cause the seeds to dry out a lot faster, meaning you have to miss them uh, more frequently than you would in a higher humidity environment. Temperature: um, if you're growing at you know 75 Fahrenheit, by increasing the temperature to 80 in your in your in your germination room, you can increase or decrease the time it takes to germinate the crops. So when I implemented a germination room, uh, there were some key crops that were pretty much two week crop cycle, or, you know, there was a few that were two week crop cycles that I was able to get down to one week, meaning seven days under lights, because I was able to reduce germination by a day, uh, just by increasing the temperature and humidity in that germination space. So uh, that could be a huge benefit in that you can get a lot more production. Now, obviously not every crop is gonna be positively impacted by having that higher temperature and humidity in the germination space, but even for the, the simple fact that you can reduce the number of waterings you have on your crop during germination time can be well worth it to have a germination room. Um, and then airflow is the last part of a germination room that's important. So you definitely don't want uh, a germination room to be completely stale air because you obviously you're gonna have higher humidity, relatively higher humidity in that space. You're gonna have um, potential for mold to develop more quickly than your outdoor space. So you do want that same slight gentle breeze to move the air around to prevent mold spores from sticking to the crops. And uh, another uh, small benefit you can implement for your germination space is to have a UV filter, uh, a UV air filter in that space to kill any mold spores that are forming because of the higher humidity. Uh, so that's just a, a something that I learned that really helped uh, prevent you know any sort of disease or mold forming in the germination room. Now to build a germination room is pretty simple. Like you can have, uh, you can go on, you know, Facebook marketplace and find a grow tent, which is often used for growing cannabis in your house. You can find those used pretty cheap. It's just like a, uh, you know, a sealed kind of room that you can put uh, fans in and put a rack in and just have crops germinating there and control the temperature and humidity with, uh, you know, simple controls. Or you could just build a room with two by fours and some six mil poly um, and a door. Uh, or you can do uh, really makeshift, which is what I did when I started, which was I had these metal shelves and I had uh, uh, coroplast, you know, just like plastic boards and I glued magnets to the boards and then put them on the four sides and the top of the germination, uh, you know, makeshift room. And then it's really easy to get access to it. Um, but eventually we built a proper room because it just, 
made it a lot easier to manage because like in a makeshift room, it's a lot harder to precisely control humidity and temperature and things like that. Whereas if you have those controls in your germination room, it's a lot easier to do that with an exhaust fan, with a heater sort of thing to keep it a bit warmer. So that's pretty much uh, everything on environmental controls for germination space, whether you're an in-home farm or your commercial facility. Environmental control is a really important aspect of growing uh, the production side of microgreens business effectively and efficiently. And having these, this information can make uh, the difference between a successful farm, having very little disease pressure, consistent crops, uh, very dry crops when you harvest uh, from, from a, a situation where you're going to have uh, you know, a lot of dampening off, a lot of crop failures, a lot of germination issues, uh, and a lot of wet crops when you harvest with poor shelf life. So environmental controls are really important. I hope this helped you on your journey of either starting or building your microgreens business or just improving your current setup. So thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you guys on the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Microgreens businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Microgreens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.